Hello everyone and welcome to the Circuit Python Weekly for February 10th, 2020. Uh, this is the time of the week that we all get together to talk about Circuit Python. Circuit Python is a version of Python that runs on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, I'm Katni and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on Circuit Python. Uh, Circuit Python development is sponsored by Adafruit, so please support them by purchasing hardware at adafruit.com. Uh, this weekly happens typically at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on Mondays, except when a U.S. holiday occurs on a Monday. Uh, we will post notices in the CircuitPython channel on Discord and uh, let everybody know um, as soon as we know that there will be a meeting moved. This meeting is recorded. Uh, it is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server in the circuit python voice channel and we record the chat the circuit python channel chat and um, everybody's voices so if you are uh, would rather not have your voice recorded um, feel free to post your updates to the text channel and we will read them off um, and uh, so you're still able to participate if you don't have a microphone or if you prefer not to be recorded. Uh, we, um, we have a notes document that accompanies this video and uh, that is where you can post your hug reports and status updates. And that is where if you are lurking and you still have updates, feel free to add them to the notes and we'll read them off uh, as we get to you in the list. If you're listening to this later and you find that you can't participate, but you um, still want to have, uh, still want to report some updates, you can always add to the notes and say that you're missing the meeting and we'll read them off uh, as though you were here. So uh, this video will be posted on YouTube and the audio is posted to uh, podcast services all over the globe. So if you find that your favorite podcast service is missing this podcast, please let us know so we can resolve that. This meeting is held in five sections, I believe. Um, we keep making it bigger, so uh, which is great. Uh, the first section is community news, which is a discussion of uh, everything that is Python on hardware in the community. It's sort of a preview of our Python for microcontrollers newsletter, um, but it's a chance to just hear what's going on with CircuitPython in the um, in the community. The second section is the state of circuit Python libraries and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to see the pro or hear about the project by the numbers um, and uh, just discuss um, what uh, what the status of it is. The next section is hug reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to call people out for doing good things. Um, it is held in a round robin where the person who is running uh, that portion of the meeting will start and then we'll go down the list in alphabetical order. Again, if you are lurking or don't have a microphone um, or would rather not um, have your voice recorded, you can add your... Um, you can add your updates to the notes and we will read them off uh, in the same alphabetical order. The next section is status updates. It is also held as a round robin in the exact same format. Uh, same things apply. If you are lurking, let us know. If you want to add updates, uh, you can feel free to do so and we will read them off. The last, se the last section is called in the weeds, which is an opportunity for more long form discussions. Uh, so if there are things that come out of um, status updates that sort of turn into uh, requiring a longer discussion, we can add it to in the weeds. If you already have a topic that is outside of status updates and is something you want to discuss, feel free to add it to the notes and we will um, go to you when we get to that point. Um, and it's best to please provide your in the weeds topics throughout the meeting um, and or during status updates so that we're not waiting around at the end. We can just go right into in the weeds 
and have those discussions. And that is how this meeting goes. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil with Community News. All right. Thank you, Kenny. You are welcome. All right. First up, um, hot off the press, sort of. Um, Scott's talk from Pi Cascades is up. Um, I have a time-coded URL that I just put in Discord. And I also have the video itself unlisted on our YouTube. Sometimes conference videos, um, they might get dinged with um, YouTube copyright stuff or who knows. So I always try to make a, a copy and have it unlisted um, for our team. Also, sometimes on mobile, the URL time code thing doesn't exactly work. And this is like an eight hour long video. So you can watch it there. I'm going to be doing a blog post uh, by the end of today because I'm going to put that in a newsletter. If you haven't seen it um, or if you're uh, looking for a quick uh, review of it, it was excellent. Scott did a really good job. And so you can, you can see and hear all about it. Next up, uh, congratulations, MicroPython. They reached 10,000 stars on GitHub. CircuitPython is based on MicroPython. Congratulations to the MicroPython community, Damien, and everyone over there. Looking forward to more cool stuff inside of CircuitPython and things with MicroPython. Next up, um, we announced this. If you're going to PyCon, everyone's getting a clue. See how that, see how that word works pretty nicely? That, they're getting a clue. We haven't the foggiest clue. Everyone's getting it, finding clues. Um, it's about 3,300, I think, altogether clues. Um, so everyone, if you're going, you get one. Special thanks to DigiKey, who made that possible. Next up, um, we're seeing a lot of bicycle projects that are starting up. Um, Joey, who's uh, well known for the open book feather um, project that won the Hackaday Take Flight with Feather contest. Uh, did some really neat stuff right away, and then we're posting up a lot of stuff. Uh, the Bluetooth low energy things that we're doing is unlocking all of the sensors and things that have Bluetooth that you can finally do something with. So um, we're using it with Clue. You can use it with some of our other boards. But uh, Dan, Scott, and team are working on a lot of um, Bluetooth low energy stuff. Uh, Joey has a, a bike computer already. So check that out. Um, I'm trying to keep up with the Open Hardware Summit badge updates that Drew and Alex and uh, I think Michael are working on. So um, when I see photos and more, I'll, have, I'll update either the blog post or I'll just do a new blog post. The latest is that there's a REPL that runs on it, and you can see some of the hardware and more. Um, speaking of Open Hardware Summit and Open Source Hardware uh, Association, the certifications that they do, uh, Michael Weinberg, who is the chair, I think, or pres of Open Hardware Association, and also happens to be a lawyer, does a post with Make every month or so. And uh, one, I think that's good, so people see that there's new things that are getting certified. And two, um, I like to look at it for like, okay, what are people doing that makes it easy for them to make and share hardware? And it looks like lots of Feather stuff, that format's taken off, um, and then adding CircuitPython, uh, the open hardware badge is in it. And it seems like that's one of the things, um, we're up to 111 boards on circuitpython.org slash downloads. And you just get so much when you're using some of these open formats or like Feather, or you know, an open source language like CircuitPython. So kind of neat. So check it out. Um, it's one of the trends that um, that we're excited about, of course. And then um, last up, uh, some of this stuff is in the weekly newsletter. Thank you everyone who tags us and adds us and lets us know about news. Uh, it'll go out tomorrow around 11 a.m. So if you want to add anything, there's still a little bit of time. Um, I'm going to wrap it up by probably 5 p.m. today. Then Ann helps out with it, and then we send it out tomorrow. Um, but uh, if you need to get anything in, this is the time to do it. And that is the community news this week. Back to you, Kenny. Thanks, Phil. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, next up is the state of Circuit Python libraries and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project, uh, which doesn't just include the Circuit Python language, it also includes all of the libraries and our uh, Linux single board computer um, wrapper uh, Blinka. And um, this gives us a chance to just hear about how everything's going for the whole project 
and to um, discuss uh, just any kind of statistics that we want to talk about. So uh, I will get started. Overall, um, we had 41 pull requests merged by 12 authors. Uh, some new names in there, Stitches and Burns, uh, New Buck, Ignashold, Biffo Bear. Uh, these are names I don't recognize, so welcome and thank you for contributing. And um, we had 11 reviewers, which is excellent. Um, I want to say a specific thank you to uh, Foamy Guy, who has recently picked up um, doing a lot of reviewing and testing uh, and has been super helpful. And also to J. Edgar Park, who um, it doesn't typically, he's, he's one of our Adafruit folks, but uh, doesn't typically show up in the reviews. So that's excellent to see that there as well. And we had 19 issues closed by eight people and 11 opened by nine people. And that is across all of this. Um, so overall, we're not down, uh, which is excellent. Um, in terms of things in general, we're still working towards 5.0 stable, um, which is to say right now we're working towards uh, 5.0 release candidate, uh, which is super close. Um, I know everybody's working real hard to get through all the bugs and get us to a point where we can have a solid release candidate. And once we do that, um, obviously, if you have the opportunity, please test it. Uh, it can be as easy as taking your project that you already have and just running it with the new circuit python the latest release and telling us if it doesn't work um, it should work the same uh, or better and if that's not the case uh, we need to know so we can fix that before we actually release it um, the in terms of the libraries we are working very hard to get through uh, open prs and so on um, and to not let those sit and we've been uh, keeping up with that pretty well I think um, and that I think is about where we're at overall so with that I will turn it over to Scott to talk about the core hello thanks Katni uh, first and foremost we had six pull requests merged from five different authors uh, Ignis Hold uh, which is probably butchering it and uh, Nubak are two new authors, so thanks to those folks. And I believe the new box is uh, some board requests, so excited to see that. Uh, we had five reviewers as well, so thank you to all the different reviewers. Uh, we have 14 open poll requests. Uh, most of them are under a week old, which is amazing. I'm excited to look through those. I'm a little behind, but uh, thank you to everyone for those PRs. Uh, Issue-wise, we had five closed issues by three people and five open by five people, so we're net uh, neutral, which is great. Uh, for a total of 253 open issues, uh, you could go to github.com slash Adafruit slash CircuitPython slash issues uh, to see all the open issues. We've categorized them into milestones. Um, we have three issues that are not assigned a milestone, and we have 10 open issues on the 5.0.0. Uh, milestone as well, which is the one that we're going to pay the most attention to, given that we're trying to get 5.0 out the door. Um, and uh, again, we don't have any download stats this week because I think we have too many downloads for, for GitHub to be happy with us. So uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Katni. Thanks, Scott. All right, next up is the libraries. Uh, so this week we had 35 pull requests merged. Um, with Stitches and Burns and Biffo Bear being uh, on that list and uh, by seven reviewers. And we have in the notes the list of merged pull requests, a majority of which were handled within uh, 24 hours, which is excellent. And we closed one of our oldest PRs out, uh, merged that, which is also excellent um, as we are trying to get through those. Uh, we had 14 issues closed by eight people and six opened by five people so we are net down leaving us with 139 open issues uh, we currently have 20 open pull requests the oldest of which is 373 days and the newest of which is within 24 hours uh, for a list of either of those things please visit circuitpython.org contributing uh, you'll find all the information that is listed here um, and details about the open issues and open pull requests. And if you're looking to start contributing to CircuitPython, 
uh, reviewing and um, checking out issues is an excellent place to start. We are perfectly happy to help you get started on Git and GitHub if you are unfamiliar. We have a guide and we are always available to answer questions. So check out that uh, link if you are looking to get started. Uh, in terms of library updates in the past week, we had two new libraries, which was uh, BLE Heart Rate and the Clue Library. And then we had a number of updated libraries, uh, the list of which I will not read off um, as it is fairly long. And that is where we are with the libraries. And now I will turn it over to Melissa to talk about Blinka. Hello, I'm Melissa. I go by Maker Melissa. And this information is regarding Blinka, which is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers. Um, we had, this week we had two pull requests merged by one author and two reviewers. Um, we have one open pull request at this point, which has been open for four days. We have two closed issues by one person, um, 31 open issues at this point. And in on PyPI downloads this last week, we had 2,320 and we have currently 38 boards supported. I'll turn it back to you. Excellent, thank you. And that is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries and Blinka. Next up is Hug Reports, and I am going to turn it over to Jeff to uh, get started with Hug Reports. Hello. Every week, we like to take some time to thank others for the good stuff they're doing. Whether it's somebody who helped you out directly or someone doing good in the community, that's up to you. And we call that section Hug Reports. Uh, as Katni mentioned, we do this in a round robin fashion. I'm going to start, then follow the list alphabetically, and jump back up to the top until everybody has a turn. If you can't attend, or you're text only, then I'm going to read your notes from the document when your name comes up. If I miss somebody by accident, please speak up or drop a text note on the channel, because uh, I miss, missed somebody last time. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, on to my hug reports. And speaking of butchering names, uh, I want to thank uh, Zoltan Voros, who is V923Z on GitHub, Andrew Gatherer and Thomas Schuker for their awesome work on ULAB, FFTs, and Spectrographs. Uh, that's code that I got to build on last week, and it was just so easy to get stuff up and running. And that's going to turn into, well, that's turned into a pull request, and we're going to merge that real soon. I also wanted to thank uh, Summersoft, Katni, and Dan for working on this releases problem over the weekend and just for keeping the community informed. And um, that's it for me, so I will read Jerry's notes. He sends a hug report to Katni for the awesome Clue Spirit Level demo and a group hug. Um, and now it's time for Katni. Hi, Katni. Hi, thank you. All right, so I wanted to give a hug report to Foamy Guy for his first library release. Um, he's been uh, doing a lot of stuff with uh, testing and merging PRs um, and got added to our review team. Uh, which also gives permissions to do releases. And so we um, went through how to do that, and he did that uh, last week. So that was excellent. Uh, to Summersoft for dealing with the bundle and releases breaking, um, we had to do some digging to figure out what happened, but the um, the right now uh, the bundle isn't building properly there's no release assets so there's no new libraries um, in terms of like the actual download files so uh, we we did a bunch of digging I can talk about that in my status update and um, found out where the issue was and Summersoft uh, put a lot of work into that so thank you um, I want to give a hug report to Jerry for testing my clue demos and making a suggestion regarding the spirit level demo uh, the bubble was not acting like a bubble it didn't rise and that was a suggestion by him to actually make it more like a spirit level so that was an easy thing to implement and i appreciate the suggestion to dan for adding tuple support to palette in display io it previously only supported uh, hex and a lot of other there's a number of other libraries that use palette to control color which meant that that necessity to use hex was passed through into those libraries um, and after some discussion, we decided to add uh, tuple support to 
uh, palette. So thank you very much for that. Um, I want to give a hug to Jeff for running hug reports and status updates today and to Melissa for taking notes. And that's what I've got. Thanks, Katni. Uh, King or North is lurking. So now we're ready for maker Melissa. Hello, let's see. Uh, oh, I'm in the wrong section here. Where did, oh, here it is. I'm on the line break. Uh, okay, I wanted to give a hug report to Tanu for representing us at Pi Cascades and uh, group hug to everyone. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Certainly is lurking. MS Costi is lurking. So that brings us to Sedacious. Howdy, everybody. Uh, so I've got a couple. Uh, first off, to Summersoft, Katni, and Dan for being uh, quick to address the issue with the releases um, and for keeping everyone informed. Uh, it was nice to see. Um, let me know if you guys need any help. Uh, another one to Dan for getting the um, BLE cadence and speed sensors for bikes uh, going, uh, getting the um, drivers available for those. Um, I'm not sure if it's one or two, but either way, thank you. Um, that allowed the, the next thing I have to happen, uh, which is another thanks to and hug for uh, Dylan DiHarada for kicking butt on the Pilot Pond demo. Um, it's looking great, and I will probably put one on my bike when I get it out of the garage, which will probably never happen. Uh, another thank you to DigiKey and Adafruit for sponsoring, putting the uh, clue in all of the PyCon uh, swag bags. Uh, I'm expecting to see a lot of cool things come out of that, both during the con and after. Um, so that's going to be really fun to see. Uh, that board is just so dang cool that I can't imagine that you know anything short of all kinds of fun stuff will happen. Um, and uh, lastly, one to uh, Dan for um, pointing me towards Bill Binko's Air Talker Sip and Puff code. Um, Bill wrote this a while back um, to help out someone, and um, I'm working on a Sip and Puff demo myself, uh, and uh, so I was able to get some good ideas from it and uh, integrate it into mine, and also, of course, to Bill for writing that in the first place. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, Scott, what do you have for us this week? Hello. Uh, first, uh, I spent all weekend at Pi Cascades down in Portland, and it was just awesome. So a huge hug report to everyone uh, who put uh, Pi Cascades on and attended. Uh, it was really, really cool. So thank you for that. Uh, shout out specifically one for Paul Stofferian from Teensy. Uh, based in based outside of Portland, so he jumped in and decided to do his first Python conference, which was really cool. Uh, and he actually brought a bunch of Teensies that he had flashed with the early Circuit Python code, uh, Teensy floors with Circuit Python on it, and was giving them away to folks. So that was really really uh, cool to hear that that he was doing that and uh, jumping into promoting Python on Teensy. It was really really awesome. Um, Thanks to Keith Packard, uh, creator of Snack and also a board, I forget what it's called. Might be just Snack board, but it runs CircuitPython as well. Uh, last minute, I uh, asked Georgia to, uh, if Keith was going to be at Pi Cascades, he wasn't, but uh, he, I don't, I, hopefully he didn't have plans he disrupted, but we, he came out for dinner and we got to sync up and that was really cool. Um, thanks to Je uh, Jeff Epler for reorganizing the ULab docs at my request. Uh, really happy to see things consistently documented. And I know it's kind of a pain, uh, but I appreciate you doing that work. Um, thanks to James Bowman uh, from X Camera uh, for the low-level EVE graphics driver PR. It's not quite in yet, but uh, it'll be really cool to see uh, CircuitPython work with the Gameduino shield. Um, for those of you who don't know, the EVE chip is actually like a graphics, kind of like a basic graphics cardy sort of IC. Um, and this low-level module will do bit packing sorts of stuff that makes the code interacting with Eve much quicker. Uh, so excited to see that. And then uh, lastly, thank you to Terry Oda from uh, the MicroPython and CircuitPython community for doing a talk at Pi Cascades. 
about making a, a soldering kit for Maker Faires that runs MicroPython. It was really, really cool to see someone mention DigiKey and KeyCAD at a uh, Python conference. I thought it was really awesome that Terry included both uh, the software sides of things and the hardware uh, sides of things for what is prim primarily a software audience. So thanks to Terry for that. And that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, TG Techie, you're up next. As always, a huge community hug for the work you do and the amount of time and care you put into such an awesome product. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, do you have anything for us today? And welcome. I don't uh, know that I recognize your name. Uh, Andrew seems to be, well, somebody's typing in the, uh, okay, Andrew's just lurking. Well, it's good to see you and uh, hope to see you again. Anne is lurking and Carter is lurking, but left us some um, hug reports. He says, hug to Dan H for helping figure out some BLE stuff. C. Grover is lurking, so that brings us to Dan. Hello, everybody. So um, first of all, thank you, Jeff. Uh, so much for getting new lab going in sort of Python, like almost immediately. And we're having a really good discussion with the, um, the developer of the library and it's, it's all working out very positively. So thank you very much. Um, thanks to Scott for going to Pi Cascades and talking there. I haven't had a chance to watch his talk yet, but I'm going to do that really soon. Uh, Thanks to Summersoft for debugging the specific issues with the um, bundle build. I think it was Summersoft who, who figured that out specifically. Um, uh, thanks to Lucian Higher Effect for adding even more STM32 boards. They're coming fast and furiously. Uh, thanks to Nubok, I don't know how to pronounce that exactly, for the Circuit Brains boards, which have been added to Circuit Python, Circuit Python over 100 boards now. Um, thanks to James uh, Bowman, who I think is known as the bald engineer, for working on Game Duino uh, bindings. And he's working on a PR to Circuit Python right now, which is under development. Um, thanks to Lady Ada for saying, hey, come on, how about just fixing this uh, simple long term thing, which is that when we can't find a file, um, instead of just saying we can't find a file, we should say what the file name is that we can't find, which is has been a support issue. Uh, so now it does. If you try to open a file that's not there, it will tell you the name of the file that isn't there, which is great. Then people can debug their typos and things like that. Uh, thanks to Dylan and John Park and the Ruiz brothers for working on a, a BLE bicycle sensor project that you'll see shortly. Uh, which is in great shape, uh, working out very well right now. I wrote the original library and they took off from that. All right. Thanks, Dan. Um, Dave P is lurking. Uh, David Gloud left us a note in the docs. He thanks Katni for the clue library that he plans to use next week. Uh, and then we go to Du Wester, who is also listed as lurking who has a hug report for Foamy Guy and Catney for patience and persistence while walking me through the Titano weather station code issues I was having. And uh, that brings us to you, Foamy Guy. What's up? I don't hear anything. Is your mic on? Well, let's go on to higher effect and then uh, foamy guy drop a note oh okay go ahead and read his uh so foamy guy says group hug to everyone working on clue got mine this past week and i've had tons of fun with it already and a hug to katney for showing me the ropes of pr reviews merging and releases and yeah thanks so much foamy guy uh the help is awesome keep it up um anyway higher effect Uh, this week, thanks to uh, Scott and Lady Ada for a good conversation about uh, priorities going into new STM32 territory. 
um, thinking about the uh, the F7s and H7s and expanding out in that direction. So that was a nice conversation. Uh, also, thanks to them and also Dan for uh, the reviews this week on um, and testing by uh, Lady Ada on the uh, Esperino Pico boards and the Discovery F407. Um, I appreciate those reviews. Thank you. Thanks. Jason P is lurking, and I think that brings us all the way around. So if I didn't miss anybody, we are going to jump ahead to status updates. Status updates. Oh, are... this oh, is. Hi. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, uh, just uh, hi. Uh, thanks to Lady Ada for um, merging a pull request for the Open Hardware Summit badge to add the buttons on for that, and uh, thanks to Michael Welling and Alex uh, Camilo who've been uh, working on. Um, uh, testing out the badge, and Alex is making a programming jig, so things are going along nicely with uh, number 100. Awesome. Thanks for the update. And uh, I'll learn one of these days to look at the list of people in the voice channel and not just the document. Um, OK, status updates. We're going to run this in the same round robin fashion. Just take a couple of minutes and let us know what you did last week and what you're planning to do this week. If it's a longer topic that you want to open for discussion, please hold it for the final section in the weeds. If you've got a discussion topic but haven't put it in the notes document yet, this is your uh, final notice that you should do so. So uh, last week, um, we switched the jet player over to portrait mode. There's this register that's called MADCTL, and you can switch the rotation either in CircuitPython software or by setting this register. And uh, Lady Ada made the decision that um, although it risks creating some tearing if you're updating the screen quickly, uh, probably users of the Pi Gamer were going to benefit more by having the faster updates, particularly of bitmaps, um, when we set this bit and we don't do software rotation. So once she changed that, I could switch Jet Player to portrait mode, which just makes it more comfortable to handle. Uh, I started a port to Pi portal, but uh, none of the touch logic does anything yet. So it comes up on screen, it plays MP3s, but you can't interact with it. Uh, the thing that I had the most fun with last week was this ULab. And, you know, Scott and Dan praised me for how quickly this got somewhere, but that is because of all this code I could rely on and um, the porting efforts that were uh, already done by Gatherer A. And so it made it real fast to get something that uh, was working and did stuff. Uh, also, I did a detour. I thought, oh, I can pick up an item on the NRF for the PWM audio output, and it just didn't work out this morning, and I was grumpy about that. But, uh, you know, I needed to give it a try. Anyway, this week, uh, today and tomorrow, I'm working on Jet Player. Wednesday is a travel day for me. Uh, Thursday and Friday, I will be back to working on ULab, and I will have rever reduced hours while I'm traveling. And so my ongoing fun item is I'm going to be in the Austin, Texas area from the 13th to the 19th, and the Dallas area from the 21st to 23rd. If you have any travel tips or want to see if we can find a time to meet, DM me. Uh, that's what I've got. So, Katni, what do you have? All right. Thanks. So last week, I finished the Clue library, released it in, into the world, and immediately received bug reports like you do. Uh, so I fixed some bugs. And then uh, finished the Clue product guide, which is no longer in moderation. It has been released. So Yay. if you are looking to get started with your Clue or you want to know more information about it, um, please check out that guide. Uh, there's pinouts, images, there's downloads available, information on all the sensors, that sort of thing. Um, it's a good place to start. And then started creating a series of Clue demos, some based on something called Sensor Lab from Arduino. Um, I completed a height calculator uh, where you use, use, it uses the um, barometric pressure sensor and altitude. You set it somewhere, zero it out, and then lift it up, and it tells you the difference. Um, I did a spirit level demo, which is a graphic um, spirit level. It has concentric circles and a dot in the middle and when you move it the dot rises and a temperature and humidity monitor where you customize it by setting temperature and humidity ranges and then um, it turns the text blue if it drops below the range it turns it red if it goes above the range and there's an optional audible alarm that will go off when either of those events happen 
I began guide pages for each of those demos. They're for now going to live in the clue guide and um, they have an intro, the code, um, they will have images and then a simple explanation of the code. Um, and then lastly, uh, Friday, of course, um, dove into the fact that the bundle didn't release properly and then realized that none of the libraries were going to release properly either. It was a change made in the third-party GitHub action that we use to upload release assets. Um, they changed how they did one thing and it turns out that that particular thing used to be hard-coded and now it's dynamic and therefore um, it messed with how uh, how we were using it. Um, so Summersoft has a pull request in for fixing that. Um, the developer who wrote it was engaged at least in the issue that was initially posted. Um, there hasn't been any activity on the pull request um, since then, but uh, I we will you know we'll we'll keep you updated and let you know how that goes. Um, for now, we are every time the bundle is released, um, Dan has been setting it as a pre-release so that uh, CircuitPython.org at least continues to point to the last valid uh, bundle release. So for your own knowledge, um, at the moment, if new changes are made to a library, they're not in the bundle. Um, it will, obviously, once we get this updated, everything will go back to how it was and um, no changes to how we're doing things will be necessary because it's all handled in the background. So that was last week. Uh, this week, today is Library Monday, of course. Um, so I'll be going through making sure that, um, well, actually I won't be going through making sure everything's been released. Uh, that's typically what happens on Library Monday, but not this Monday. Um, but I'll take a look at any issues, open issues, PRs, that kind of thing. Um, see where we're at with stuff and make sure that um, nothing's getting missed. I need to do blog posts for three recently released guides. Um, I still need to work on the uh, documenting running this meeting so that others uh, will have something to go on if they want to um, if they want to run this meeting we're, we're trying to broaden um, who's involved so that more people can uh, be involved in it um, we need to get images or videos or both for the clue demos i mentioned earlier for those guide pages uh, and then after um, those pages are done we're going to start more demos um, a compass demo maybe next um, or I'm brainstorming uh, just general ideas for stuff to do with the clue, which is uh, kind of difficult because there's so much to do with the clue. Um, so many sensors. So uh, that um, at least probably gets me through Wednesday. Uh, Thursday is a travel day for me, so I will not be available, um, but I will be back around on Friday uh, for at least part of the day. And that's what's going on with me. Well, someone keeps busy. <laughs> King of North is lurking, so make her Melissa. Hello. So last what's week up? I was heads down again with adding functionality to the web plotter to make it work with Sensor Lab. And I uh, was able to update some of the Raspberry Pi installer scripts for the kernel level TFT drivers bugs and work better, such as adding rotation to the 240 by 240 when using the console. Um, this week, I'm going to do some more web plotter sensor lab integration, but I'm hoping to uh, get back to working on some more of my pending PRs. All right, Mr. Certainly and MS Costi are lurking, so Sedacious, you are up. All righty. Uh, so um, this week, but I think the previous week or so, I wrote the guides for the LIS 3MDL and LSM DS33 sensors. One is a magnetometer, the other is a combo Excel and, uh, or rather, accelerometer and gyroscope. Um, so that was a while back. Um, last week, I worked on the guides for the ICM 2649 and the LIS 
32 MDL. Yes, that's it. Uh, lots of numbers and letters. It gets confusing. Um, the latter two are waiting for uh, PCBs and to get into the production for um, the final pictures for the guide. Um, since then, I've been working on a uh, sip and puff demo uh, using the um, LPS 33 pressure sensor. Uh, it's like the LPS 35 that I wrote a driver for a long time ago. It seems it's been a while, um, except for the fact that it has a little uh, port on it that you can attach a uh, O-ring to, or in my case, a little piece of tubing. So I was able to get that plugged into a OLED screen, stem aboard, and then into the uh, STM32 Feather to have a totally stem QT plug and play uh, step and puff device. Uh, all I had to do is uh, stick some tubing onto the uh, the port on the, the sensor. So I've been working on the code for that and I got it in a pretty good place where it's uh, displaying the um, <clears throat> current pressure, um, various threshold, pressure thresholds um, and um, detection events on the OLED screen. And then I um, added some code to make it so that people can um, essentially write little plugins that get callbacks when there's different event types. Um, so I'll, just, I'll be wrapping up the software on that today and then starting on the guide for it. And um, it's been really kind of fun getting to work on user space code. I've been doing a lot of drivers and libraries recently. So um, it's, it's been fun to use parts of my brain that have been slacking off for a while. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, this week I'll, yeah, I'll be doing other stuff after that assuredly, but what that will be at this point, I'm not sure. Well, that's cool <laughs> stuff. Um... Scott, tell us about Pi Cascades. Hello. So I spent, uh, I drove down on Friday to Portland, which is like three hour drive from Seattle, uh, and just met a ton of people and saw some folks that I knew. So Paul was there. Uh, that was awesome. Um, Georgia, Thea, Nina were all there uh, as well. Um, I spoke last, <laughs> which is the first time I spoke last, which was uh, pretty interesting. And uh, for those of you who haven't watched yet, the video is all about, our, or the talk is all about uh, Python's next decade in us. It's a very big vision uh, that will come to you folks as members of the CircuitPython community. Uh, no surprise at all, but the gist is that uh, we should focus on the folks that don't program yet and uh, work on getting them on board. So uh, check out that video. There's uh, Phil posted the links earlier there, and the official video should go out in the next a uh, few days. I think they're pretty quick with it. Uh, so shout out to Elaine who was doing all of the filming and stuff. So thanks. Thanks to her. Um, last week before I took off, I got a uh, four ish PRs and pushes out around the BLE sensor, like broadcast net stuff. Um, I'm still pretty excited about it, but I do want to kind of like get it to a state that people can actually try it and use it. Uh, one of the weakest links right now is the using ESP32 as a bridge. Um, so the more thought I could take a look at using a Raspberry Pi to do that. So I may actually try to get some basic, uh, underscore BLEIO stuff working in Blinka, which would be cool. Um, by basic, I basically mean, uh, just the advertising side of things. Um, and then we'll be able to use like the, a Raspberry Pi as a bridge rather than, uh, just the ESP32 spy stuff. Um, because I was gone all weekend, like I got home at like 11 PM last night, <laughs> I, I didn't even have time to like try to get to jump on emails and reviews. So, uh, sorry if you're waiting for me, but I plan on getting uh, through all of that today. Um, and then of course I'll have some more to do tomorrow, but that's all good. I uh, love to see all the activity. Uh, last thing I wanted to note is that, uh, as of last week, uh, Monday morning, uh, you don't have to be a good coder at all. We just, I was counting all code coders, good and bad. Um, anybody who hasn't done it at all is, is my interest. Um, sorry, I got distracted. Uh, Zephyr is a open source, uh, real time operating system with a lot of backing from a lot of different companies, uh, including Nordic. Uh, they have a completely open Bluetooth stack. Uh, yeah, don't, don't worry about distracting me. Um, which is really neat and interesting. It's interesting because it has a lot of different involvement from a lot of different companies like TI and ST and NXP and Nordic. Um, so uh, Adafruit joins the Zephyr Foundation, uh, which is part or related to the Linux Foundation. 
Uh, and so we actually do have a voting, we, we can actually vote in their technical steering committee stuff if we go to it. So uh, I'm kind of curious, I'm planning on there an hour long meeting on Monday morning or on Wednesday morning. So I, I'm starting to sit in on those. And uh, I was reached out to by uh, one of the folks there, they wanted to chat privately today. So I'll be doing that as well. Um, I think there's some interesting commu community work and insights that we can provide into the, the Zephyr organization. Um, and I'm really curious to see how uh, like a an open source project with a lot of different companies paying people to work on it works. Um, a lot of their focus on the engineering side, I think, is more like product design stuff. Uh, Dan and I uh, have taken a look at it before, and that like they hard code a lot of things. Like you know, in Circuit Python, you can just say like, make this pin in I squared C, and we do that all logic for you. Whereas uh, that usually happens in in Hal's in general and Zephyr too, where you do that at compile time rather than runtime. Um, so there's some interesting things there to chat with them about. Uh, so we'll start engaging with Zephyr, but we don't have any immediate plans to switch over to it. We are kind of just keeping our feelers out for interesting uh, real-time OSs to potentially move CircuitPython on top of uh, to get us better um, concurrency sort of primitives under the hood. Uh, and then maybe also once we have those good primitives under the hood, we can start to think about how that impacts the Python side as well. Um, so yeah, that's me. Uh, sensor broadcast net stuff. So if anybody has like a sensor network at their house or is playing around with it, let me know. I'd love some folks that are willing to try it too. So uh, let me know. Can we just take the Bluetooth stack and leave the rest of it? Or it's probably pretty well intertwined with their real-time OS primitives. So I suppose Yeah, it's not really clear to me. Out. It's not clear to me. They they have something called West, which is the like their package manager slash build manager as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, so throw away your build system for CircuitPython and take theirs to use the RTOS. Uh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's going to be my general feedback when I talk to them today, which is like, it would be cool if it was all more separated mm -hmm. <laughs> so that we could. And and the, like I asked uh, one of the other folks on the committee, like, do you have any examples of taking an existing project and moving it into Zephyr? Right. And the answer was like, not really like they have a really cool uh, they have a good minimal example um but it's still just like create a new repo and create all these new files and it's just like no i have a large repo right. um that being said there is a port for zephyr in upstream micropython um which is interesting as well and uh i got into this because i noticed uh maureen helm who works at nxp and is the chairperson of the technical steering committee was actually making PRs upstream to MicroPython. So I started engaging with her. Mm. And uh, Damien's now, I don't. I think, merged in the PRs that Maureen's made as well. So it's cool to see that moving upstream, too. All right. Uh, I kind of skipped by Summersoft, who left a text update in the channel. He says, hey, got swooped up impromptu style at work and have another meeting shortly. I'll try to get some notes in. Outside of that, group hug to all. Uh, so that brings us down to TG Techie. Wow, Scott, that sounds like a bunch of really cool stuff. Kudos and good luck. Um, so this past week, I have been working on my website um, because I realized my current projects, they're documented in my head and in the emails I send my grandfather as an update, but not in a way that I could actually use as a resume or a way that I could show people. Um, and traditional blogs just weren't feeling right. Um, so I've been using Jekyll and a bunch of CSS touch of JavaScript to make everything from scratch. Couldn't, couldn't use Bootstrap, couldn't yield the control um, over to them as well as waiting for the circuit boards for my watch to come in. And they did literally an hour ago. Um, so I'm, I'm now holding this almost wafer thin piece of me in front of me and trying to fit it into this 3D printed case with a battery motor and a bunch of chips. And it's awesome because it's all about to run CircuitPython. Um, 
and yeah, that's what I have been up to. Um, the GUI work has stalled for the past week because I'm I'm hitting some uh, theoretical roadblocks as to like scrolling and how I want page swapping to go through and if it's separating from scrolling or if you have to implement it. It's a thing I need to think about. Um, so that's next week, along with a bunch of soldering. Luckily, there's a three-day weekend. Uh, I think that's about it. Yes. Thank All you. All right. Well, we'd be happy to see a link to your website when it's in a state you're happy with. I can, I can do that. Thank you. All right. Heading back up to the top of the list, Andrew is lurking. Anne is lurking. Carter is lurking. C. Grover, are you lurking? I think so. All right, Dan. Okay, so uh, a bunch of things. So last Tuesday, um, I uh, we figured out what should go in beta five, and I built it on Tuesday night, and that's uh, available now. It has a number of fixes, which should make it uh, make it work well with BLE and some stuff like that. Um, other things I've done since then, um, there have been some complaints that uh, timed up monotonic nanoseconds and timed up sleep were only accurate to the nearest millisecond, and it turned out to be quite easy to make them to be accurate to the nearest to, to microseconds. It's still not wise to to um, rely on them for for accurate timing in the sense that there are things that go on in Python like garbage collection that can easily add a lot of latency, but it's nice to have um, more accurate timing just for, I, like I needed it for some timing purposes, for some testing purposes to get, millisecond wasn't good enough for me. I needed to know some kind of elapsed time that involved microseconds. So that's done. Um, there was a longstanding bug in the I2C speed setting on NRF, the code was just wrong, so I fixed that. Um, uh, Lady Ada found a strange thing um, in which I2C transactions readings from some sensors on the clue board were taking a long time. And if you look carefully, they actually took longer and longer. And originally, uh, I thought maybe this was a problem with I2C because I narrowed it down to a particular commit where we uh, made some I2C changes, but it turns out it really was just that those changes started using some Python code that allocated storage with a with statement. And it turns out that uh, using a with statement, causing it to allocate storage, it doesn't happen with all with statements. Um, you just It just takes longer and longer to allocate the storage as memory fills up. And then as the garbage collects, it goes back again. But it can be a factor of 10 in terms of the time it takes to do an I2C read in a loop. Or it, it really makes the loop run slower and slower. So it had nothing to do with I2C. Uh, I was just, I told my wife about this and I said, it's sort of like, we thought there was a problem with the toaster, but it turns out there's a problem with the bread. Okay. So, uh, that was, that was the analogy I thought of, uh, as Caddy mentioned, I added tuple and list support to palette.color. And this week, uh, we're going to try to knock off some more issues for the 5.00 release. And I'm going to try to again, work on, uh, SPIM3, that is the high-speed SPIM peripheral on the NRF board. Okay. I'm super excited about the time accuracy. I missed that one going by. Does that apply to all the boards across, or just one family? No, I made it work on all the boards. Awesome. Yeah. Even, even this presence, which has a completely different internal HAL. Yeah. Okay. Um... Dave P. is lurking, and uh, David Gloud has some text notes for us. He says, last week, made Cheerlight BLE Hub the ultimate IoT demo, Wi-Fi to get JSON, and BLE advertisement of Cheerlight Color. And he has got a link, which I will drop into the text chat. And then, second, started to add features to the MLX90640 Pygamer thermal camera. And he is comparing it to the feature set of another thermal camera called Danny UHY18. And I'll drop this other link in the chat. 
this week, getting a clue and more thermal camera updates. Uh, Drew Fustini, what's up? Hello. Um, so got the um, buttons added for the Open Harbor Summit badge uh, into CircuitPython. Playing around today with um, SVG to Shenzhen to get the Blinka logo into the, um, the silk screen on the badge. Um, and then we'll be looking at seeing how we can get it to be lower power um, on the badge and also looking at how to make like a menuing system that'll call their programs that people put on the badge. So uh, that's it for me. Thanks. Cool. Uh, Fomiga, are you ready to try your mic again? Can you hear me now? Yes, awesome. Go ahead. Excellent. All right, so uh, for last week, I finished up uh, and got pushed and merged in an uh, example for the gizmo. Um, it's a thermometer. It's just a, a very basic one, draws a bitmap on the background and splash some data from the thermometer on top of it, um, but leads to a nice, nice example to learn from. And then um, the rest of the stuff for last week was I did a bunch of compass and inclinometer examples for different accelerometer and magnetometer uh, breakout boards. And then, uh, as Katni mentioned, uh, I learned a ton from her about um, the, the process of merging pull requests and doing releases in the libraries and all of that stuff. And then the last two were uh, I got my clue device and spent uh, a, a ton of time, perhaps possibly more than I should have, but that's okay, uh, playing with it. And then um, I dove into the, the BLE stuff in CircuitPython 5 for the first time. So I know that's been out there for a little bit, uh, but I hadn't had a chance to really play with that. So I kind of got my feet wet with that. Um, and then next week, I've got on my plate uh, to work on the Neo Trellis M4 tone example um, to try to track down a, a weird issue I saw um, playing audio out of the mixer and see if I can't um, kind of nail that down and figure out more specifically what's going on and get an example to show off um, to some of the folks here and see if we can't figure out if I've done something wrong or, or what's going on there. Um, and then uh, I want to play with the Bluetooth some more. Um, and then uh, the last thing for me really is just to keep um, working my way through the list of issues. So I've learned a ton uh, working on the ones that I have. Um, and I just want to take, you know, keep working through that list and figure out if there's more uh, stuff that I feel like is kind of within my capabilities at this point. So that's where I'm at. Well, keep understand, uh, keep expanding those capabilities because, uh... You know, you're learning all the time, and you'll be able to do an issue next week that you couldn't do this week. Sure, yeah, that's what that's one of the the coolest things so far has been just how much I've learned, even on the the relatively basic stuff I've worked on. So for sure, great. Uh, Geek guy is text only, so uh, they are working on a small update to the MSA three hundred one library, but that uh, gave them a GitHub headache. Uh, we're here to help you with GitHub stuff, so ask questions. Uh, maybe that was the authentication issue that went by earlier. I'm not sure. Uh, also working on adding animations to the HT60, uh, HT16K33 library and the alphanumeric display. I already have some good progress with one animation that uses the entire display. And now we are on to you, Hire Effect. Oh. Uh, this week, or this past week, I uh, added the Esperino Pico and the Esperino Wi-Fi. Uh, those are two boards that are normally used for a JavaScript interpreter, uh, and now they do Python interpretation. So um, it was a pretty, <laughs> pretty straightforward uh, swap for what they, the features they have on those chips. Um, they, uh, the Esperino Wi-Fi has a uh, ESP32 on it. Uh, for Wi-Fi access, but unfortunately, it's a little old, apparently, so um, it may be a while before that gets the full Wi-Fi feature set. It was a very tiny board, one of the smallest SCM32 boards I've seen, so that's kind of cool. Um, I also added uh, core temperature readings and core voltage readings to the SCM32 port, which were some of the kind of the last 5.0 issue for that that we wanted to get done. Um, and To, or a 407 discovery board, uh, which, which has a, a pretty uh, large feature set. So that's uh, a nice thing to have, too. Um, in addition to just kind of the 
uh, regular upkeep work, uh, I got to sit down um, just over text with uh, Scott and Lady Ada. We talked about the upcoming STM32 do. So that includes adding uh, support for uh, kind of the next level up in ST, which is the STM uh, F7s and the H7s. Things like uh, uh, one of the projects I'm really excited about is the OpenMV, uh, Open Machine Vision project, which is a camera module that can do some pretty advanced camera work. So I'm I'm very interested in it's kind of opening it up to a new category of powerful sort of Python equipment. Um, so that's all uh, pretty exciting. This week, though, uh, before getting started on any of that, there's a couple more things that we want to get done for the STM32 port. So that includes Pulse IO and Rotary IO, which are two pretty straightforward peripheral or uh, modules to uh, add in. Uh, and we've also had some bug reports recently. Um, there's some kind of, there's some little you know startup crashes uh, that it was startup crash that just got reported and uh, documentation issues uh, that might require some build. Uh, we have a whole set of build flags that are basically how big we want a circuit Python build to be. And those have been a little bit of a mess um, <laughs> since I got in with the STM32 and started having to change things. Um, so uh, it would be good to, to revisit those before we move into a whole new I'm hoping to address those pretty quickly and get started on some exciting new hardware, uh, which I still have to order. Um, uh, and then uh, beyond all that, speaking of Zephyr, Scott was talking a little bit about Zephyr, but I do on the side, not related to STM or not related to CircPython work, I'm working on a Zephyr tutorial about getting set up with the basic uh, Zephyr RTOS. Um, they have a pretty good startup tutorial on their website, but it kind of misses some, if you're a very, very early beginner to embedded work, um, there's still definitely some stuff that you wouldn't pick up, I think, about how uh, kind of a project is structured and how where, where you should put everything. So I'm hoping to kind of cover all of that stuff and, uh, and make it really, really simple for people to get up and running with Zephyr. Because um, if you're looking to really make the have the absolute best speed or make a commercial project out of something um, for it's going to get the most out of a board like the STM32 Feather. Um, able to access uh, just a, a lot of that uh, raw capability. Um, uh, excited to work on that as well. And that's it for me. What form is that tutorial going to take? Is that going to be on a personal blog or a guide? Or do you know yet? Uh, no, that's, that's going to be a learn guide. So awesome. Um, yeah, uh, it's exciting. It's my first learn guide. So um, and hopefully it'll come out okay. All right. Well, Jacob T is lurking. So that brings us down to in the weeds if I haven't missed anybody. Uh, Katni, do you want me to go ahead and kick off in the weeds? Sure, if you want to. All right. Well, in the weeds is the time reserved for longer discussions. Um, anything where you think there might be some back and forth and whether that's coming to a community consensus or getting a question answered, uh, now's the time. You have one last chance to add to the notes, but I'm just going to take it from the top in order. So uh, David Gloud, who is, I think, still uh, text only says, should there be a mini library bundle for the clue pi badge dot dot dot? The rationale is that for a board with a lot of sensors or a library that has a lot of dependencies. Oh, hi, David. Are you going to take over? Yeah. Do you hear me? Yes. OK. Well, um, yeah, I don't have the text. But basically, um, in the past, we used to unzip all of the library and drop that into an express board. No, it's too big. So we have to do it one by one. And for some of the boards, the main library is requiring sub-library for all of the sensors. So if there was a single zip um, with all the stuff you need for a clue, um, I don't have it yet, it's going to come tomorrow, or for the Pi badge, maybe that's going to be easier because what most of the guides are doing uh, nowadays is to say you need this and this and this and this library to do 
this um, program where if you can say take the basic zip um, and you have everything or take the basic zip plus that extra stuff so that was the idea I don't know if it's possible to automate that or to list what is required or whatever well, I think it's certainly possible, but that, uh, you know, is work for the library authors and, you know, you, it would be like requirements.txt, but for CircuitPython, I don't know if there's somebody who's interested in implementing it. That's probably the main question. I think it's an interesting idea. Yeah, that, um, that would be just the GitHub automation that, that, that create the zip with whatever is required for this mode, but it, it will duplicate the files, but. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the only downside I can think of is if whenever we release a repo, uh, library, we also have like a zip with dependencies, then potentially like we'll have old dependencies in that um, rather than the latest versions of the dependencies as well. Right. I've seen, I can't remember exactly where I saw it, but isn't this something where you include like a frozen, you include frozen libraries in the build settings or something like that? Yeah, so, but we've done that where the RAM constraints mean that we can't just put them on the, uh, on the device in the file system or the, not the RAM, but the flash storage constraints. Frozen libraries are a support problem because you have to redo the CircuitPython release to update the libraries. Um, so we only do that when it's absolutely necessary. And it, that sort of was limited to the M0 um, where it was absolutely necessary. OK, that's good to know. I, I think the issue that uh, Scott was alluding to is this, that there's like a reverse dependency issue where whenever the library changes, you'd have to update everything that depends on it, um, which is certainly possible, but it's a lot of work that we should balance against, um, you know, if there's another way to solve the same problem. And I feel like the, the core issue is just that, you know, when you are working on a thing, you want to get all the libraries for that thing and have it be super easy. And I, I think that, you know, generally speaking, falls under the category of dependency resolution. And mm -hmm. I know myself and Thea and some other people have been really interested in tackling that because it's it's been a problem. Uh, it, not a problem exactly, but it's, you know, it's just something that we've had to deal with and we're going to have to keep dealing with it and it's not going to get worse. So, so my idea was to say, okay, you have the five zip with all the library for version five, and there would be a PyBase zip with all the main library you need to use that specific hardware. So it's just to create that specific zip at the same time as you create the main ones with all of the piece together. Uh, so are you talking about just having board specific zips? Yeah, for something the ones like that. that. Have their own, like for the yeah. sort of Python or the um, TPX and the other ones that have their own little. Yeah. Okay. That would well, be certainly more tractable. Yeah, the scope is much smaller. You don't do it for every library, you do it for these top level hardware enabled li enabling libraries, I guess. Yeah, and whatever they depend on. That would also be kind of handy for users who maybe don't know the full capability of the board they're working with and the, the libraries that are on there kind of give some indication of, you know, everything that they could try uh, that's like board specific. Yep. At, at least it will help me because yeah, every time there is a new version, I seek the file and oh, I did that one, need that one, and yeah, oh, trial and error until it is happy. And sometimes you only notice when you go to that specific line that you are missing one library and it's runtime. So yeah. Mm -hmm. The thing that yeah, I've yeah. been doing lately, um, or I, just, I say lately, but I've done it twice now, is creating a separate guide page on the product guide for that board that has all the possible libraries that you might want. Um, so it doesn't necessarily apply, like it's not specific to demos that are in the guide. It's it for, this, for the Circuit Playground Blue Fruit, it was basically all the libraries that you would want <coughs> or need to run 
pretty much any demos that we did. And I did the same thing for Clue. Um, and we'll update that as we, you know, come up with more BLE demos and so on for that. But it's it's just a page that has like a list. It's not it's not a click and go, but it's it's a separate page that is just a list of all the libraries that you need for all the functionality on the board. So um, this is also kind of adjacent to what CircUp does, but that looks at the device at the CircuitPy file system to find out what to update, right? It doesn't help with your initial install. Yeah, I believe so. Okay. And the, the other thing that occurred to me while Katni was speaking is, you know, if a board has a display, do you put every package that enhances mm -hmm. and works with display IO or do you pick and choose? I think we could come up with sensible defaults and you know, say, if you want this other stuff, here's how you do it. I feel like um, the, the critical thing would just be like for some, like on the meow bit, for instance, there's nothing that's actually obvious about visiting the meow bit page or anything like that, that actually suggests what the screen is, right? It's actually, it's, it's basically undocumented information um, until you really, really dig in. And so uh, a base, collection of libraries that just says yes this is the screen that you have to use and, and here's like the very basics that you need to get started with the board so hypothetically would this go in the bundle or would there be a new repository for clue where all of these things are sub modules and it has its own releasing process or for somebody who was interested in taking up this work where would they start is it a fresh github repository is it a pull request into an existing one. Where do you start? Good. I was going to say, I think if it's a documentation thing, it could be in learn guides like Katni's suggesting. And we could also do it in the board pages on circuitpython.org. Um, that's the other place we could put it. Uh, because we have, you know, boards that are not Adafruit boards. That's where we could document it. Um, and then, uh, I imagine that if it's a matter of like a zip file, we would just do it as a release artifact on the like board specific library. But a, a release artifact is going to come from a GitHub repository. So which one? Like for a circuit playground, it would be on circuit playground or clue. It would be on clue. That okay. would mean you'd have to be able to override the default uh, action setup, right? Also, that yeah. doesn't help. You'd with, have a knob. Um, boards that don't have a um, that doesn't help with boards that don't have a board specific library. Yeah, I would think of it more in the bundle. Like it's just another another bundled thing that's built. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a mini bundle I was thinking about. Yeah, yeah, that's the way I think of I, it. Well, I, I think that makes sense because Adabot can take care of it. And then I feel like we're going to want to have this on circuitpython.org anyways. Yeah. So might as well just have it just go straight there and then we can link to it from the individual repos for the boards themselves works for me okay well now we just need somebody to do it <laughs> right so the so the, so the 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 ideal would be in the bundle repo there's one file per board that describes the libraries that should be in a bundle for that board and then it builds those into release artifacts. So you get your clue-5.x.zip or whatever it would right. be called. Yeah. David, does that uh, cover what you wanted to cover? Non-in-bundle library. Perfect. What, TG Techie? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. What if... Um, someone makes a board and they want to include a non cookie cutter compliant non in bundle library. I don't think that should be happening. Like, okay. That's like we, we could help someone do something very similar in like the community. But that's certainly an option. Um, yeah, we're, we're happy to help that. But I, I, I feel like if, if something is going to be in circuit Python, supported this space that should you know comply to good documentation and you know standards and whatnot 
Yeah. Good. Other folks can always provide other zips. Like if you want the mechanics of a per board bundle, then it should be through the mechanics that we have. And as Sadisha totally. says, like we have the community bundle for that too. Totally understandable. Just trying to cover all the bases and Yeah, it's a good a, a, a good thing to think about. Thank you. And also uh thanks for whoever kind of added the one sentence summary of that to the notes document. I think mm -hmm. sometimes we get to the end of in the weeds and it's like we discussed that, but what was the conclusion? Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks. I think we're ready to move on to you, Cetaceous. Cool. Uh, so one thing I forgot to mention in my uh, updates for what I've been working on is over the weekend, I uh, was able to unbrick my droid that I had bricked previously by trying to talk to it with uh, JLink Commander. Um, so I was able to dump the firmware from the second one that I bought and get it on the first one and it's working again. Yay. Um, so I am able to get back to working on that project, which is really fun. So I've been working with people in the, um, uh, galaxy's edge discord. Uh, they have a makerspace channel and there's been a lot of reverse engineering going on about the Bluetooth protocols that are involved in looking at the firmware and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, so my project, my personal project for the next while is to um, work on a CircuitPython library to allow you to interact with your droid. Um, ideally, it would run on something like a Clue. Um, I don't know exactly what the feature set is going to be at this point, but um, if there's anyone that's interested in working on this with me, um, help would be appreciated. Working on it can be anything from, you know, actually coding to, you know, testing to working on documentation to whatever, you know, just, just the same way that anyone can help out in some way on Circuit Python or other open source projects. If you're interested in this, if you like bots, if you like reverse engineering, whatever, just um, at me in Circuit Python and we can talk. Thank you, Sedacious. That, uh, those were the two topics that we had for In the Weeds. So if nobody else has anything else, I'm going to turn it back to Katni to wrap things up. Thanks, Jeff. Bye. All right. So this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for February 10th, 2020. Um, if I remember correctly, we have a U.S. holiday coming up. Uh, which means we will be moving or possibly moving the meeting, which I guess is another thing we should discuss before we wrap up. Uh, I was planning on moving it because I will be not here. Okay, then we need to make sure we notify everybody. Um, I'll so do that right now. Next week, uh, the meeting will be moved. Um, so it will be on uh, Tuesday, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, at uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and, uh, this video, uh, the recording of this will be posted to YouTube and eventually to podcast services. Um, other than that, uh, thank you everybody for participating. Um, we are always happy to hear about what's going on in the community and what's going on with, um, everybody involved, not just with the official CircuitPython folks. Uh, it's always amazing to hear what everybody's doing um, and sync up. So thank you very much to everyone for participating, and we will see you next week on Tuesday. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Bye. Thank you.